Welcome to Stage 3 of the Computer Simulation Project. Stage 3 introduces some key new features to the simulation. These features include the modeling of the nature-nurture dynamic, the introduction of a simple supply and demand economy, which includes the creation of occupations for all the humes, the caring of orphan children, and the first political system. Each stage of this simulation project builds on the previous stage, so watching stages 1 and 2 first is recommended. There's a link in the description. Before we start running the simulation, here's a quick review of how it's set up. Humans are represented in the simulation by what is referred to as humes. Each hume has a number of characteristics, which include the key ones of gender and age. Type of thinker. Type of thinker has only just been added to the simulation. There are three broad types of thinking that either a male or female can have, each of which are represented by the top and collar a hume is wearing. These braces indicate a practical thinker. A collar indicates an analytical thinker. And an open collar indicates an abstract thinker. These general thinking types can be applied to any culture at any time in history. And across any culturally reproducing population of humans, about 60% of them are practical thinkers. These thinkers act on the physical and social world directly in order to solve problems in the moment. And they are the most important individuals in any culture as they make it possible for the population to survive and reproduce. These thinkers include all types of manual, trade, and office workers, caregivers, police officers, and soldiers. Next we have the analytical thinkers, who make up about 30% of any population. These individuals organize the practical thinkers to perform collective functions and use short and long-term planning to solve more complex problems. In a modern society, these individuals would become engineers, architects, business managers, film and theater directors, teachers, senior priests or monks, etc. Finally, we have the abstract thinkers, who compose about 10% of any population. These individuals think and work independently, in a very general way, to understand the form, nature, and possible solution to physical and social problems. These type of thinkers usually become scientists, philosophers, writers, prophets, or any type of theorist. So the type of thinker a Hume is will greatly influence the type of occupation they would get in the simulation, as we'll see. The next characteristic that all the Humes have is their neurochemical preferences. These neurochemical preferences are simply brain processes that each Hume enjoys stimulating on a regular basis. And they form what can be thought of as the disposition of each Hume. So for this particular Hume, the area of his brain that he has a first preference to stimulate is sensory awareness, represented by yellow. And his second preference is rationality, represented by blue. And for this particular Hume, her first preference is other awareness, in green. And her second preference is metaphysics, in purple. So together, the first and second preference constitute the disposition of a Hume. And as with real humans, their disposition is the way in which they contribute to their culture. Which is an important aspect of the simulation, as we'll see. Only the top two neurochemical preferences can be seen for each Hume, as represented by the color of their clothes. However, each Hume has a value for each of the seven neurochemical processes of their brains, which can change throughout their lives, due to the influences that are acting on them. But the Humes also have inherited neurochemical preferences that don't change throughout their lives and can be thought of as analogous to their DNA. The values for each of these inherited processes are constant and are passed on to their children with a small amount of variation. So it's worth keeping this in mind while watching the simulation. All Humes have two sets of neurochemical preferences. A fixed inherited set which is passed on to their offspring. And a changing set, which is influenced by their caregivers and their culture throughout their lives. 
and it is the changing set that governs the way adult humes contribute to their culture. This is a key aspect of the simulation, and we'll see this in operation in a moment. So these are the key characteristics and attributes of the simulated humans. Now let's quickly review the layout and operational aspects of the simulation. This is the full screen view of the simulation, which is divided into four areas. And each area is divided into four sections. So if we want to look at any part of the simulation in detail, we can do so by the simple press of a key. This is area one. And this is section A in area one, which has all the time and date information. Each simulator day, is broken down into six time periods. Morning meal. Morning. Midday meal. Afternoon. Evening meal. And evening. And each hume is at a particular location, at a particular time of day, based on their unique circumstances. And also based on what day of the week it is. Here we have night time and then the day begins again. So now let's see how the humes have spread across the island over the course of 70 years. Using the fast forward feature that was introduced in the previous stage. So here's our starting population of stranded humes. Who very quickly built the main buildings they needed to survive and thrive on the island. Let's jump one year ahead to see that they have married each other now. Keeping in mind they are all unrelated. No children have been born yet. And we see the humes working at the various locations to gather food. The yam plants are here. The collection of coconuts is done in this area. And the berries, herbs, and medicinal plants are collected here and here. The fishermen are next to the coast. Now let's fast forward to year 10. All the hourly and daily processes are continuing to be done each time we jump forward. We see that quite a lot of children have been born now and the population has reached 178. And as soon as any child reaches the age of 5, this triggers the building of a primary school. We have about 30 children of primary school age, which is from age 5 to age 12. Now let's jump to year 20 to see that more and more children have been born and are growing older. If we look at the families, we see that each family does have a distinctive character in regard to their neurochemical preferences. But we also see diversity across the siblings of many of the families due to the variation which is added when the children inherit their parents' neurochemical preferences. Which is what we want to simulate. When any child first turns 13 years old, a secondary school is automatically built. There's almost 40 children at the secondary school now. And the population has gone from 68 to almost 300 humes in 20 years. We also see now that the fishermen have brought a boat. This will allow for the catching of larger numbers of fish needed to feed the growing population. The boat is built by the humes at the workshop who are called makers. They make all the food producing technology and sell it to the fishermen and farmers. Moving forward another 10 years now. When we get to year 30, the humes have moved into area 2. And in each new area, all the same buildings are constructed as area 1. But no child has yet reached the age of 13, so no secondary school has yet been built in area 2. The humes have also now cleared most of the island and established permanent food producing areas. We have farms now along the top, which grow yams, coconuts, berries, herbs and medicinal plants. And the fishermen have brought another boat in order to continue catching enough fish to feed the ever-growing population, which has now reached almost 400 humes. Moving on now. When we get to year 40, we see that the humes have started to occupy area 3. And the population has increased significantly to almost 800 humes. This is because, when simulating a traditional culture, large families are the norm. 
The female humes can have up to 10 children each and usually have a child once every two years. It's a Saturday, which is market day. All the humes spend the day at their local marketplace, buying all the food and goods they need for the week. This is the food merchant and his assistants, who buys foods from the farmers and fishermen and sells them for a small profit to the humes. And this is the goods merchant and his assistants, who buys goods from the makers at the workshop and sells them to the humes. We'll look in more detail at how the new money-based supply and demand economy works shortly. After the humes have finished shopping, they spend each Saturday evening at the stage area watching a performance. The Saturday night performance is always a play. And because it's a traditional culture, the play would be some type of morality play tied to their particular metaphysical worldview. These morality plays are designed to instruct the audience in how to behave properly. Moving on now to year 50, and the Humes have moved into Area 4. We see a funeral being conducted in Area 3, which is appropriate, as a plague is now active in the population, as can be seen up here. When the population goes over a thousand Humes, a plague is automatically activated, which significantly increases the sickness and mortality rate. This results in a quick drop in the population size over the following couple of years. Then, when the population falls to below 900 individuals, the plague is removed and the population gradually increases again. So we see an oscillation of the population size between about 900 and 1000 individuals, which continues on indefinitely. This is to avoid the screen becoming overwhelmed with humes as the years go on. And it's also a realistic simulation of traditional cultures. Traditional cultures usually don't increase in size to any significant degree over hundreds of years due to plagues, warfare, and famines. As in the case of the medieval cultures of Europe. Let's jump forward another 10 years to year 60 now. More Humes have moved into Area 4. And importantly, the Humes now have their first political system. It's a monarchy because we are dealing with a traditional culture at this stage. We'll look at political systems and their simulation in detail in future videos. But for the time being, the Humes simply have a king who chooses these representatives from the four areas to advise him. And finally, let's move forward to year 70. Basically all the houses have been built now. This will be the final layout of the simulation. We have an oscillating population of around 1,000 humes living in about 250 homes. So this use of the fast forward feature has allowed for a quick overview of how the humes have increased their population and spread across the island. And it has also shown some of the major new features of the simulation. But there are also other important new features in this stage 3, which are best seen by following the actual lives of individual humes. So let's examine the lives of two of the humes. The first one we'll look at is born in year 51 in area 2. Here he is at the hospital on the day of his birth. We'll call him Boyd. And he lives at house 69. Boyd's father is a maker who is employed at the workshop. He's an analytical thinker who has a first neurochemical preference of other awareness and a second preference of dominance. Boyd's mother works at the Berry Farm. She's also an analytical thinker who also has a first neurochemical preference of other awareness but a second neurochemical preference of metaphysics. Boyd is their first child. And because he's a male, he inherits his father's fixed genetic neurochemical characteristics with a small amount of variation that makes him a unique individual Hume. And these fixed characteristics form the blueprint for the changing neurochemical processes that he also has, as represented here. So as mentioned, all newborn Humes have two sets of neurochemical preferences, a fixed inherited set and a changing set. And it is the changing set of preferences which is influenced by the newborn's caregivers and the culture 
during the newborn's childhood development, as we'll see. This dynamic interplay between a human's inherited neurochemical processes and their physical and social environment is one of the most important aspects of the simulation. So Boyd starts life with a first neurochemical preference of other awareness and a second preference of dominance. And he just happens to start out as an analytical thinker. But this characteristic can vary from the parents. The second Hume who will follow is born the next year in Area 4. He or she is here in the birth ward. We'll call her Anna. And she lives at House 188. Anna has two siblings. An older brother and an older sister. Anna's father is a soldier who works at one of the forts. He's a practical thinker who has a first neurochemical preference of metaphysics and a second preference of rationality. Anna's mother works at the Berry Farm with Boyd's mother. She's also a practical thinker who has a first neurochemical preference of self-awareness and a second preference of other awareness. Anna is their third child. And because Anna's a female, she inherits her mother's fixed genetic neurochemical characteristics, with a small amount of variation, which also makes her a unique individual Hume. But in Anna's case, her mother's fixed inherited preferences are different to the ones she now has, which have changed over the course of her lifetime. So Anna is born, with a first preference of self-awareness, but a second preference of metaphysics. And the four starts life with slightly different main neurochemical preferences to that of her mother. And she just happens to also be a different type of thinker to both of her parents. She's an analytical thinker. As mentioned, the type of thinker a child is can vary from its parents. So let's return now to running the simulation for these two humes. If we fast forward to year 56, we see that Boyd has turned 5 years old and now attends his local primary school in Area 2. Here he is on his first day at school. Likewise, in the following year, Anna turns 5 and attends her primary school in Area 4. Here she is on her first day. So after 5 years of being influenced, mainly by their mother, the two Humes now come under the influence of their primary school teachers as well. This have the effect of shaping the neurochemical processes of the children, particularly Anna. Here she is at age 8. It's year 60, and we see that now she has a change in her neurochemical preferences. At birth she had a first preference of self-awareness and a second preference of metaphysics. Now her first preference is metaphysics and her second preference is self-awareness. This is the result of three years of influence of the teachers at the primary school, where the social environment and curriculum develops metaphysics and other awareness in all the children. And in Anna's case, because she already had a second preference of metaphysics, it was relatively easy for the school to develop her first preference into metaphysics. Returning to Boyd now. In year 64, when he is 12 years old, his mother becomes sick and is moved to the hospital, as we see here. Because a plague is currently active, there's about a 90% chance that a sick Hume will not survive. And as we see, his mother has died. She's only 31. Deceased Humes are moved to the morgue, and in the afternoon two undertakers place the Hume into a coffin. A funeral is held the next day. Only relatives of the deceased attend the funeral. So Boyd's father is now a widower with four children. Later in the year, Boyd turns 13 and now attends the secondary school. Here he is on his first day. So he'll now have new influences on his disposition in the form of secondary school teachers. And in the next year his father remarries. So he also has a new influence on his neurochemical processes. His new mother, as seen here, is a widow with seven children of her own. So now Boyd is living in a household with eleven children. In the case of Anna, in this same year, she turns thirteen and attends her secondary school. This is her first day. Then in the following year, her mother also becomes sick and dies at age thirty-two. 
which is once again a young age. But not unusual in a traditional culture, in a time of plague. And the plague hits again later this year, when Boyd's father becomes sick and dies at the age of 34. And unfortunately for Boyd, his troubles get even worse the next year, when his new mother also dies from the plague. So now Boyd and his siblings are orphans. When children become orphans, the simulation does a search of the population to find a suitable relative of the children to look after them. A search is first done of the mother's relatives, and if a suitable one isn't found, a search is then done of the father's. And if no one is still found, the children are placed in the orphanage. In Boyd's case, however, the mother of his new mother is still alive. She's a 62-year-old primary school teacher who is a widow, and she lives in Area 1 with her three grandchildren. The actual parents of her grandchildren have also died. So now she's caring for all the orphans of her own children. Plus Boyd and his siblings. So when all the children move in, she now has 14 children to care for. This may appear excessive. But once again, in a traditional culture such as this, during times of plague, this type of situation wouldn't be uncommon. And given the realistic settings of the simulation in regard to family size and mortality rate, these types of outcomes would be expected to occur occasionally. Boyd is 15 years old now, and when he turns 16 at the end of the year, he gets his first job. He's a maker, like his father was, and is employed at the workshop in Area 3. All the workshops are cooperatives, which make goods and sell them to the goods merchants. The money they make is then divided between the number of makers in each workshop. So Boyd is never sure how much of an income he will get each week. But usually it's a reasonable amount. The next year, Anna turns 16 and gets her first job. It's at the Yam Farm. Here she is on her first day. All the farms are also cooperatives, which sell the foods they produce to the food merchants. And then divide the proceeds between the workers. The advantage of the co-op system is that if a Hume is injured and is off work for 10 days, which is the recovery period, they still get a share of the money that the co-op makes. So they share the benefits and the problems associated with earning an income. This type of system is a consequence of a strong sense of other awareness in traditional cultures, where the health and welfare of all members of the population is the primary concern. This will change, however, when we move to a modern culture where the emphasis is on self-awareness. But let's return to Anna and Boyd. So at the end of year 68, both of them are 16 years old. At which age, Humes are permitted to marry. We'll assume that they have been socializing with each other at the Friday and Saturday night performances for a long time now. And at the end of the year, they get engaged and marry. The wedding is always held at the worship center in the area where the bride is living and is only attended by relatives of the bride and groom. This symbol is an arbitrary, universal symbol that's used to signify the vows of commitment they make in front of their community. After the wedding, a house is found for the newlyweds. If there are no empty houses available, a new house is built. However, in Anna and Boyd's case, there's an empty house in Area 1. So they move into House 22. And in the following year, they have their first child. Here's Anna in the birth ward. The child's a female. So it will inherit Anna's fixed neurochemical processes with a small amount of variation, which will make it a unique Hume. However, because it's under two years old at the moment, it's shown as having sensory and self-awareness neurochemical preferences. This is because the assumption here is that all newborns start life with a strong preference for these two neurochemical processes as they favor infant survival. So Anna and Boyd have a child now, and every Saturday, which is market day, they buy the food they need for the week from the food merchant. Adult humes eat a fixed amount of food every day. And children eat half the amount. If both parents are working, 
they split the cost of the food. If only one is working, he or she pays for the food. And if they don't have enough money to pay for the food, it comes out of the community welfare fund. This is a fund, which all working humes, pay a small amount of money into each week. In order to help out families in need. Once again, this fund is a manifestation of other awareness, which is one of the main characteristics of traditional cultures. Whether you prefer a traditional, or modern culture, depends on your own neurochemical preferences. So all the humes, buy the food they need for the week, from the food merchant in the area. Who in turn, buys the foods from the food producing areas. So we see, the food levels drop for the week, after their sale to all the humes at the marketplace. Perishable foods, like fish and berries, are not stored for sale next week, but any leftover yams, coconuts, or herbs, are stored for next week. The other important activity, that occurs on a Saturday, is the buying of goods. If a hume has money left over, after buying food, they will buy a good. Which good they buy? is an important aspect of the simulation. The goods are broken down into seven major categories. One for each of the seven main neurochemical processes of the human brain. Here are just a few examples of the types of each goods. And a hume will buy a particular good based on their first or second neurochemical preference. As buying and using the good stimulates that particular area of their brain and makes them feel happy. In Boyd's case, he buys a good from the other awareness category, this week. It might be a small toy for his child to play with. And Anna buys one from the metaphysics category. It could be a small religious icon that she places over the child's cot. Believing it will protect the child. It's important to make the comment, that buying items, is one of the key ways, humes contribute to their culture. The buying and using of one type of good, and not another, results in a greater manifestation, of the type of neurochemical process associated with that good, in the culture. So for example, a dominance culture, is one in which a large percentage of the population buys and use weapons, and restraints. Another awareness culture, is one where individuals buy and use caregiving goods, like first aid kits. And a sensory awareness culture, is one where people buy and use musical, artistic, and culinary products. And so on. So in every case, that a human, or in this context, a hume, buys a culturally made item, they make a specific type of contribution to their culture. We'll see more about this in future videos. Returning now, to Anna and Boyd's life. Anna continues to have children, about one every two years. So by year 81, the couple have four children. Anna lost two in childbirth. But with the infant mortality rate set to about 30%, this is to be expected. In this year, one of the doctors at the hospital in Area 1 dies. So a vacancy becomes available, and Boyd is lucky enough to get the job. There are only about eight doctors, out of an adult population of 400 adults, so Boyd is to some extent lucky. But the main reason he got the position, is because, first of all he's an analytical thinker, which is essential for a doctor. And secondly, his first neurochemical preference is other awareness, which is also a job preference. He's also 29, which is an acceptable age. So the simulation, did a search of the population, and found that he was the most suitable Hume for the position, at the current time. The job pays a lot more than he is currently getting as a maker, and it's a set amount each week. So the couple continue to have children. And by year 89, they have eight in total, with seven living at home. The eldest child has married and left. Anna lost another one in childbirth, during this period. But the couple are unusually lucky, in that they haven't lost any older children to the plague, which is the case, for most of the other couples in the simulation. The number of children might appear excessive, but this is an average-sized family, in this simulated traditional culture. In this year, 
we also see that one of the primary school teachers has died, in Area 2, and Anna is able to get the vacant position. And, as was the case with Boyd, this is a lucky situation. There's only about 8 primary school teachers, in the population of about 400 adults, so Anna is fortunate. The simulation chose her, because she's an analytical thinker, which while not essential for a primary school teacher, is preferred. And she has a first preference of metaphysics, which in a traditional culture, where religion is taught from a young age, is highly desirable. So her wage is higher now, and is a set amount each week. Unlike the varying income, she received as a worker at the Yam farm. But the good fortune the couple have been having, come to an end, next year. Boyd gets sick, and is placed in his own hospital bed. And because the plague is currently active, there's a 90% chance he won't survive. And he doesn't. He's only 39 years old. He's moved to the morgue, and the undertakers place him in a coffin in the afternoon. His funeral is held the next day, with his relatives, and their children attending. And so Anna is left a widow, with seven children at home. She's 39 years old. She continues working as a primary school teacher, and doesn't remarry for 11 years. During this time, she takes custody of an extra three young children, who are related to her and have become orphans. Then when she's 50 years old, she marries a Hume who is one of the political representatives of Area 1, and is an advisor to the king. Here he is here. He's a 51-year-old widower, with all his children grown up. Anna and her children move in with him, and she continues working at the primary school in Area 2. The years go by, and when Anna is 56, she gets sick, and is placed in the hospital. The plague is once again active, and she doesn't survive. She's moved to the morgue, and placed in a coffin. And her funeral is held the next day. And so we see the end of the simulated lives of Anna and Boyd. Their lives were fairly typical, of the thousand-odd Humes, in the simulation. All of whom, experienced similar events, and contingences, created for them by the algorithms of the simulation. And this now also brings us to the end of the video. The next video to be shown, will be a companion video to this one, which introduces an important new graph. So hopefully you'll be back for that. Bye for now.